faithfully and consistently in accordance with the principles and practices of a holistic, uh, biblical, and Christian worldview. And this would be one of those eclectic, eclectic mornings. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank Wayne Whit Whitaker, who's in the back, uh, handling our sound system, and, and John Berry for video recording this forum. Uh, over the past 12 years, Areopagus has sponsored over 250 uh, seminars and forums on topics related to Christian apologetics, uh, history, science, significant books, and contemporary cultural issues. Uh, for more information on the ministry of the Areopagus, uh, including many of our publications, please visit our literature table over here. Also, if you're not currently on our email contact list, and would like, uh, for, uh, and would like for us to let you know about upcoming events, at forums and seminars, uh, there's a sign-up list on that table as well. That would be that would be very very welcome from our perspective. In addition, we have books and literature available from Mark Tooley, the Institute on Religion and Democracy feeder check out. So there's some interesting things over there. Uh, following our presentation, we will have a Q&A session moderated by. Uh, well, it said Bruce Phillips, but it's been crossed out. It says Bill Smith. So Bill Smith at the CS Lewis said, so I can sit down and just enjoy the presentation, not worry about the Q&A. Q&A is harder to do than you might think sometimes. It's a, it can be very difficult. Uh, please keep your questions as brief as possible. That's one of the problems right there. Please keep, this is not a time for, to make a statement. It's a time to ask a question. That's great. Uh, and then so that we can get in as many as possible. Uh, uh, I am told that uh, there is a there is also a booklet to draw your attention to a booklet on natural law because, of course, just war theory will be one of the things which will come up in the conversation when you talk about divine justice and things like genocide of the Canaanites. And that's been a topic of conversation and discussion in the academic and theological circles for as long as there's been academic and theological circles. So you might want to take a look at that. And of course, uh, we have Paul Copan's books over there as well as God a Moral Monster, which is which is his, 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 his as, far as, as far as I know, his first uh, venture into this territory. And now, did God really condemn gen uh, command genocide, which is his new book, for which I I presume a lot of the material that you hear today has uh, had plays a part. Uh, and then, perhaps most importantly, before I introduce Paul, uh, coffee is on the way. Oh. <laughs> I told I, I have no idea. Coffee, coffee's on the way. <clears throat> and also, if but for some reason you manage to wander in here without registering uh, for the for the princely sum of 15 bucks, we'd appreciate it because we are a 501c3 not-for-profit and hopefully not-for-loss organization. <laughs> now, uh, it falls to me also to introduce Paul Copan. Paul's here? Yes, there he is. He's so good. Uh, Paul was born in 1962. He's a Christian theologian, analytic philosopher, apologist, and author. He's currently a professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University, uh, holds the endowed Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics. Uh, he has written and edited more than 25 books in the area of philosophy, of religion, uh, on apologetics, on theology, science and religion, and the historicity of Jesus Christ, as well as contributing many articles to professional journals and essays for edited books. For, him, for six years, he served as president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. I've heard Paul speak on numerous occasions, and I know you're in for a treat today, so please join me for the warm welcome for our speaker, Paul Cohen. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. My wife always reminds me to prepare my workspace. Uh, she's a physical therapist and just well organized as it is, so, uh, so I try to get my stuff in order here. And um, I need to keep an eye on the clock too, so I'll take out my watch. All right, well, thank you, Bruce, for that introduction, and I'm glad to be with you all. Thanks for joining, uh, joining me on a uh, rainy uh, Atlanta day. It's good to be back in Atlanta. I've lived here for about six years. And uh, Bill Smith and I worked together at uh, Robbie Zacharias International Ministries and had a wonderful time of um, working together and uh, speaking in, uh, in, in venues like this. Uh, we, <clears throat> you may be aware that uh, just yesterday began the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of remembering the uh, Armenian genocide by the Turks. And uh, so over a million uh, maybe a million point five um, uh, Armenians who were killed by the Turks. In fact, the, uh, my dad's in Ukraine, where there's uh, uh, very disturbing uh, business going on with uh, Putin and, uh, uh, and the invasion of Ukraine and uh, uh, more uh, such uh, activity uh, looming. Um, I've seen the other rumors in the air that uh, Kiev is next. 
uh, and that this is the, uh, that uh, there are rumblings of something happening in May or even June um, to, toward that end. And uh, my dad's from Ukraine, and uh, my father, uh, his grandpa's grandfather, uh, died as a result of um, starvation uh, through the uh, Stalin's uh, forced famine in Ukraine. So, uh, so again, that was, uh, uh, you know, part of my own history. Uh, but, uh, but here we are talking about the question, did God really command genocide? And, and what, does that, uh, you know, what does that look like? A lot of people, like Richard Dawkins, will say that God is this uh, genocidal uh, maniac uh, who is, uh, is, is commanding the, uh, the Canaanites to be slaughtered and so forth. Well, is this, uh, you know, you know, is this a fair charge? Uh, how do we differentiate between what's going on in... Ukraine, or what's going on, what went on in uh, in Armenia, uh, with the um, you know with what's going on in the Bible. So what we hope to do is unpack some of this, and uh, again we'll have room for question and answer. There is a book uh, over there uh, that goes into a lot more detail and has summary uh, bullet points at the end to uh, to help digest some of the uh, you know some some you know some more philosophical discussions. But this uh, hopefully will help to. Uh, give you a good foothold for launching into the into the chapters themselves, but uh, the book is called *The God of the Command Genocide*, as I already mentioned. But what I'd like to do is address this topic by looking at a lot of preliminaries first. There's a lot of unpacking to do before we look at actual texts, and uh, and so what I'd like to do is spend the majority of time kind of preparing our preparing us for going into those uh, texts. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll, uh, as I said, probably not have a lot of time for a Q and A uh, immediately, but uh, save up your questions for uh, for later. <clears throat> well, as we look, first of all, the preliminary considerations. Uh, the first one that we ought to remember is that God issues certain commands in a context of a warfare uh, society. Uh, war is part of the ancient Near East. If you uh, are not prepared to do battle, you will inevitably become extinct. Uh, you know, so, so this is part of the ancient Near Eastern society, uh, the culture uh, in which you, you find yourself, that, that fighting is simply a part of this. And, and God speaking in the, this set of inferior circumstances, Jesus says God permitted certain things because of the hardness of human hearts. Well, we see human heart-heartedness uh, here in the, uh, in the engagement of, uh, you know, of, of just constantly battling and invading and so forth, and that God uh, uses this uh, in the accomplishment of his purposes. But more on this later. We also need to remember that there are commands that God gives that are not joyfully given, that are not given in a positive way. They're not given in a spirit of delight, but rather with reluctance, just as God was grieved to bring judgment upon the earth during the time of Noah. So God issues commands to drive out the Canaanites, not because he is delighted to do so, but uh, he does so with a heavy heart. Uh, and God himself tells the, the Israelites, uh, or, you know, the Judahites in, uh, in, in uh, Ezekiel 18 and 31, that, you know, that God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from their evil ways and live. He says, why will you die, O house of Israel? So God is reluctant in bringing judgment. In fact, Lamentations 3 tells us that God does not afflict willingly. Uh, so this is not something that God is just, you know, really doesn't care. He, he, no, there is a, a grief in his heart when he uh, brings judgment. So we see that this is connected to the state of, of, of hard-heartedness, that, uh, that God does issue commands given human hard-heartedness, but God is also willing to receive those who repent. In fact, when Jonah goes to Nineveh, he is, uh, you know, he, he's reluctant to go to the place uh, where his enemies are because he is afraid that they are going to repent because he knows, as he says in chapter 4, that God is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, that God would do this sort of thing, that this is characteristic of God, and he didn't want that to happen to his enemies. And certainly this happens, we see this with, uh, with Rahab, uh, who becomes a follower of the, uh, the God of Israel. We see the Shechemites in chapter 8, 
who joined this uh, covenant renewal ceremony with Joshua, these strangers in the midst of the, uh, you know, of the Israelites who are part of this covenant renewal ceremony. These are Canaanites, but yet they're joining up with the Israelites. They recognize who the, the one true God is. We see this, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come to this in, in just a moment uh, about the signs and wonders. But we see that there is a, along with the, uh, these commands, we need to remember that there is a distinctiveness that there, that there is a, an unfolding of the plan of salvation that God has, that there are unique circumstances that God is calling his people to undertake. When God calls Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans, he sends, sends him to a place where he doesn't know. He sends him to the land of Canaan. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should say, oh, therefore we ought to do this too and pick up and, and we need to move to a place where we don't know. Uh, well, no, this is a unique command, a unique calling, and similarly with the Israelites, they have unique commands and a unique calling given their status in the unfolding of God's salvation historical plans. So we, we need to talk about things that are temporary because a lot of people will say, oh, look at what God committed. You know, he could just do that today. Uh, and, and, and as though everything that took place back then can be universally applied. No, this is for a particular circumstance at a particular period of time. And, you know, we do this with our kids, you know, that when they're growing up, we tell them to, you know, not to do this, to do that. And, you know, they, you know, you know, and, you know we, later on, they actually may do some of those things um, that we have, uh, you know, told them not to do. Like, for example, you hold my hand when we're crossing the street. Well, when they cross the street and they're older, they don't need to do that anymore. It's just a temporary sort of thing. Uh, and so the, 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 necess the necessity of the command kind of falls off. Once they become, uh, when they, once they come of age. Now, the commands that God gives. When people say, "Oh, what if God commanded this?" Well, well, let's take a look at what the context for those commands is. We see God actually engaging in a display of amazing signs and wonders. God is not just giving, you know, speaking to Moses at, uh, you know, at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, this burning bush experience, you know, and whispering in Moses' ear, and, and no one else can get in on the secret. No, God is engaged in showing his glory in the land of Egypt by trumping the Egyptian gods, by turning water to blood, by, uh, by you know, sending the frogs, the gnats, the darkness, the hail, and so forth. You know, all of this very dramatically trouncing the gods of the Egyptians. And then, of course, leading the Israelites out of Egypt with a mighty hand through the Red Sea, uh, providing manna for them, this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. This is remarkable. I mean, any Canaanite who is wondering what these Israelites are about and then goes and you know, kind of peeps over the, the rim of the canyon or whatever, you know, and sees that, wow, there is something.